Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeets and welcome to our fifth FRQ Friday video. In this video, we'll be scoring our practice FRQ from unit five, which covers urban sprawl. But first, make sure to hit that subscribe button because the exam is only seven weeks away. I'm gonna be releasing tons of shorts as well as the rest of the FRQ Friday series to make sure that you're ready for that exam in May. And if you haven't checked out my six week exam study schedule, make sure you hop down into the video description below and bookmark it so you can use it to review every single topic covered on the exam. Now, speaking of sprawling urbanization, today's practice FRQ submission comes to us all the way from from Dubai. Thank you to Lean for sending us your practice of our queue all the way from the United Arab Emirates so we can score it and learn from it. And as always, the scoring guide is linked in the video description below. Now, if we take a look at letter A, Lean starts off on a great note, earning a point for describing how people move to rural areas in order to have bigger homes for the same price as a smaller apartment in a crowded city. She also earns a point for describing how higher crime rates in cities may cause people to move out to the rural, more remote areas. Now, the reason I highlighted the introductory sentence here in letter A is just to point out that it's not necessary and it does nothing to earn lean either of these points. In a high stakes timed exam setting where you have to write three full FRQs in 70 minutes, you just typically don't have time for these introductory sentences that don't actually answer the prompt. In part B, lean correctly identifies bronchitis due to air pollution but she incorrectly links this to living in the city as opposed to an actual increase in air pollution that results from urban sprawl. And this is why writing to the prompt is so important. If you can get into the habit of asking yourself for every describe or explain prompt, did I connect my answer directly back to the prompt? You can make sure to avoid missed points like this one. And unfortunately, Lean makes a similar mistake in her second answer for part B, again, correctly identifying increased anxiety, but connecting it to living in a crowded city rather than linking it to the social isolation that can result from urban sprawl. This is a great example of what I like to call giving a great answer to the wrong question. Basically, Lean provided two stellar answers to the prompt discuss two human health effects associated with living in cities, as opposed to the actual prompt, which was to discuss two human health effects associated with urban sprawl. Now they seem similar, but the subtle difference here can cost you points. Luckily, Lean gets back on track in part C by correctly stating that as density increases, petroleum use decreases. In part D, Lean earns another point for describing how cities can limit urban sprawl by planting rain gardens and green rooftops to minimize air pollution. However, her first answer of building shopping centers, workplaces, and parks close together isn't quite enough to earn the mixed land use point from the rubric because it's not actually something cities can do. Cities don't choose the exact locations of shopping centers and workplaces, but rather they encourage them to be built in certain areas through local rules called the zoning ordinance. And this was actually such a common mistake on this FRQ that the scoring commentary from the college board addresses it directly. You can see that lots of other students who wrote the same FRQ in 2015 described mixed land use the way that Lean did, but failed to actually describe how cities can encourage this to happen. And in part E, Lean was again right on the verge of earning both of these points, but fell just short on some key details. While the first answer might look like it's almost identical to the third bullet point on the rubric, I think the word prime on the rubric is important here. See, pretty much anywhere a highway would be built would probably be considered wildlife habitat. So I think you need to be a bit more specific and state that the highway should be planned around or rerouted to avoid known, highly diverse or dense wildlife habitats. Again, it's a subtle difference, but on a describe prompt, you wanna push for these extra layers of detail. And as I've said many times in this series before, it's possible that the exam readers in 2015 would have awarded Lean this point, but I always err on the side of being more strict rather than less strict because I'd way rather have you earn more points than you expect in May than fewer. On the second point, Lean has a great start here, but needs to link increased carpooling to fewer cars being on the road and therefore fewer collisions with wildlife. Instead, she connected it to less highways needing to be built, which isn't really what the prompt is asking. And unfortunately in part F, Lean once again, just narrowly misses a point by stating that cities can plant green rooftops to increase food production, but without actually specifying that those green rooftops would have edible plants. And we can see that this is again, a crucial detail that's explicitly spelled out in the rubric. So it's also a mistake that many students likely made on this 2000 2015 FRQ. The reason for this is that the term green roof implies plants or gardens planted on rooftops, more so for the purpose of reducing runoff and filtering air, as opposed to actually producing food. And even with missing all of these close points, Lean still scored four out of 10, which is a perfectly respectable score and higher than the global average on this FRQ when it was written in 2015. And what's remarkable about Lean's practice FRQ is just how close she was to scoring a six or a seven out of 10. See, she had an element of a correct answer for every single response that she provided 
wanted, but missing just a few key details caused her to miss out on a handful of points. And this is such a great example of why practicing of our cues can make all the difference on that exam in May. Lean's already done the hard part here of learning and recalling all of this content about urban sprawl, as well as writing well-structured FRQ answers. Each of her describe and explain prompts were well supported with layers of detail beneath them. It's just that some of those layers of detail were slightly misaligned with the prompt. And this brings us to the single biggest piece of advice that I have to offer to AVE scholars like Lean, who really know their stuff, but aren't scoring as well as they'd like to on FRQs. And that is to slow down and ask yourself one critical question before you write down the answer that's in your head. And that question is, am I answering this exact prompt in front of me? That way you can make sure you avoid the mistake that Lean made and the mistake that Ape scholars make every year in the exam, which is writing great answers to the wrong questions. And if you really want to be sure you avoid this mistake, after you've written your answer down, reread it and ask yourself, did I tie my answer directly back to the prompt? If you can answer yes to both of those questions, move on confidently knowing you've done your best. But if you reread your answer and realize you've written a great answer to a slightly different question, or you're missing details that will connect your answer back to the prompt, you can revise or add additional detail. With that being said, let's practice this new questioning method as we annotate our FRQ Friday prompt for unit six. So our first step is to read this background information and try to pull out some of these numbers that we're gonna need for these calculation prompts. So the prompt says, as conventional sources of crude oil are depleted, unconventional sources such as oil sands, also known as tar sands, are being utilized. Oil sands contain bitumen, which can be processed into synthetic crude oil. A region of boreal forest in Alberta, Canada, that covers a deposit of oil sands will be cut and removed during the process of bitumen extraction. It is estimated that the deposit contains 73 billion barrels of recoverable bitumen. So I'm going to underline this 73 billion barrels of recoverable bitumen, since that's going to be a key number we're going to need later when we get to our calculation prompts. Another important number that we're going to need here is the rate of extraction from the deposit, which is approximately 1 million barrels of bitumen per day. So in letter A, we're asked to identify an ecological benefit other than providing habitat that is provided by forests. So let's circle identify and write a one above it. And we're gonna make sure that what we're identifying is an ecological benefit, but it has to be other than providing habitat, but it must be provided by forests. So if we ask ourselves the question, what is this prompt asking us? It's asking us for an ecological benefit besides for habitats that is provided by forests. In part B, we're asked to identify one economic benefit that is provided by forests. So this is a much more straightforward prompt. We just have to make sure that when we give our answer, it is economic related, so it has some connection to money, profits, or revenue, and that it is provided by forests. In letter C, we have a describe prompt, so we'll circle describe and write a two next to it. And what we're describing here are two environmental consequences other than those related to loss of boreal forest habitat. We have a modifier, and they have to result from the extraction of bitumen we're gonna put a frame around that since that is one of the things that these consequences can result from, or the transportation of synthetic oil to customers. So we have a lot going on here. Let's reread it and make sure we understand it. We need to describe two different environmental consequences. They can't be related to the loss of boreal forest habitat, and they must result from either extracting the bitumen or transporting the synthetic oil to customers. Those last two parts of this FRQ are crucial. So once you answer this, ask yourself, did I connect these environmental consequences to extracting bitumen or transporting the synthetic oil to customers? Now in letter D, we see our first calculate prompt of the FRQ Friday series. I'm gonna circle the task verb and write a two next to it. This is because calculate prompts are worth two points. One for the correct setup with units, one for the correct answer with units. So as always, I wanna underline what we're actually calculating. And in this case, it's how many days will be needed to extract the recoverable volume of bitumen from the oil sands. That recoverable volume is 73 billion, so I'm gonna write that there. And because our answer needs to be in days, I'm gonna write blank days underneath this prompt to remind myself this is what my answer needs to be expressed in. The units are days, and this is gonna remind me to include those units in my answer. Now in part E, we have another calculate prompt, so we'll circle that and write a two next to it. In this case, we're calculating how many years. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna write blank years underneath the prompt so that there's no way that I forget I need units 
in this case years, with my answer. And we need to calculate how many years will be needed to fully extract the recoverable volume of bitumen. So once more, I'm gonna write 73 billion above that to remind myself that is the volume of recoverable bitumen. And finally, in letter F, we have another calculate prompt. So let's circle it and write a two next to it. In this case, we're given some background information and some numbers that we're gonna underline since they're gonna be key in our calculation. We know that monthly production of synthetic crude oil is 30 million barrels. So I wanna know that's 30 million barrels per month. So I'm gonna write that above there. Producing one barrel of synthetic crude oil uses two barrels of heated fresh water. So I'm also gonna write one barrel of synthetic crude oil and two barrels of heated water. That's gonna be a key conversion factor or ratio that we're gonna to need to have when we do our calculation. And finally, what are we actually calculating? We're calculating the number of barrels of fresh water needed each year. So I'm gonna write blank, and then I'm gonna write barrels H2O per year at the end to make sure that I remind myself these are the units that I need my answer to be in. And that is our sixth FRQ Friday prompt annotated and all ready for you to write. And remember that if you want your practice FRQ scored in our next FRQ Friday video, make sure to email or snail mail it to me. And since that's our unit six practice FRQ, that means we have only three more units to go in the FRQ Friday series. And then it's time for the exam in May where you will have to put all of your knowledge to the test and make sure that you think like a mountain and write like a scholar.